Have you ever had that creeping feeling that with every step you take, you're being watched? Ever worried that every family you've ever embraced might be known and traced? Imagine if mundane everyday decisions, such as meeting a friend for a coffee in town, had to be a calculated act of resistance. That you might be patted down, harassed, or processed biometrically, simply for being born with the wrong last name, in the wrong location, to the wrong racial group or nationality. Your daily life filled with the threat of detention. Your nation occupied by a military force, now equipped with new powerful yet hidden facial recognition. Consider for a moment the sheer scale of these surveillance technologies enabling human rights abuses. Imagine automated apartheid in Palestine. Imagine stopping it. In February 2022, Amnesty International identified the situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories as apartheid. A cocktail of military and legal policies are being put in place, which are preventing Palestinians from being able to access their basic rights and services. We're often told that the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories is quite complicated, but it's not complicated, it's apartheid. Since 1967, 800,000 Palestinians have been detained. As of April 2023, 1,016 Palestinians are being held without trial, compared to no Jewish Israelis. Between the 29th of September 2000 and the 31st of January 2023, some 6,000 Palestinians were killed outside armed conflict. 1,848 of those were children. But what? we don't see on the news are the sort of quiet ways that that infringes on people's daily life. We don't see, we can't see the feeling that that creates the feeling of being watched constantly, the feeling of uncertainty around, you know, if someone leaves the house, are they gonna come back that day? The term apartheid was originally used in response to the political system in South Africa, but international law, the conventions and treaties that condemn, prohibit, and criminalize apartheid are drafted to apply to all states in a universal way. There are undoubtedly compelling and very disturbing parallels between the situations under apartheid South Africa and in Israel-Palestine, but I think the differences are also important. The system, oppressive as it was, was never fully operational. And certainly that the sort of high technology claims or hopes of the apartheid government that a centralized bureau of proof could capture all useful information about blacks that this simply couldn't, uh, that this simply was not sustainable using the technology of the time. However terrifying it would be if you arrested. This was paper copies, it was not digital. By surviving into this period, where digital capacity, artificial intelligence, is so much more advanced, that gives the Israeli state far more control. Technology here is promoting apartheid. Technology here is promoting killability. Technology here is promoting a necropolitical regime that is being sold as, as, as technologically advanced. It's over the living, over the pregnant woman, over the old, over the dead bodies. I think it'll probably come as no surprise that the OPT would be filled with cameras and surveillance of all sorts. But what are the ways in which these surveillance devices reinforce apartheid logics? And the more we dug into it, the more complicated it became and the more we realized that we were missing a piece. <laughs> For a long time, we've known the first piece of this puzzle, 
that is the physical infrastructure. So checkpoints, watchtowers, cameras. When you get stopped at a checkpoint, you're stopped by you know, a soldier with a gun who will ask for your ID and you don't know what will happen after you've had that interaction. And so it's about control, but it's about the separation and making it very clear that there are some rules that only apply to Palestinians. So our kids while walking to school are asked to open their backpacks. And you know, you see how the kids are struggling. For example, the other day, a child was screaming, like, I have an exam, I'm late. There's, there, they wanted to open everything they wanted to check. Or when you open a backpack of a young girl uh, carrying uh, pads, it's so exposing, so it is surveillance. Surveillance towers spread all over Jerusalem. I've seen over the past 10 years a rapid development of infrastructure that is meant to suppress uh, and control the Palestinian population living under occupation in Jerusalem. Throughout this, this year, we see not only a huge increase in the amount of cameras, over three folds, the amount of cameras, but also the blockage of pedestrian gates and increased events around the main sites. Being and living in the old city of Jerusalem shows you the power of occupation. It's so visible, even if it's invisible. You can see it in the cameras around you, the big cameras, the small cameras, the hidden cameras, the flying cameras. You can see it in the amount of the police and the soldiers, the military that is around. The Israeli forces of occupation have devised different methods. They've changed the architecture of the streets, of the squares, to prevent people from gathering and prevent people from pursuing their social activities in a normal capacity. Just look at Damascus Gate and um, what they call the watchtower, what we call the killing boxes. We see that the architecture has been turned into a photographic studio. Lighting has been placed on both sides of the entrance to Damascus Gate with cameras facing the people as they enter through the gate, walking towards the streets of the old city. You're probably used to seeing and hearing about low resolution CCTV in black and white. These cameras are of an entirely different making. We're talking about high resolution 4K cameras that can sometimes capture you of up to 200 meters uh, of distance. And we're talking about cameras that plug into network systems that use databases to identify you. And then I want you to think about the fact that these cameras are pointed at mosques, at hospitals, at schools, at people's homes. No movement can be actually achieved from the Palestinian area without a person being surveilled throughout the entire route. It's a sense of being policed all the time. And being policed not as a normal person being policed. You're talking about um, uh, about a state whereby we are the other and the otherized, we are the occupied. Facial recognition is incompatible with international human rights law in three major ways. First, it violates the right to privacy because it relies on the curation of a large-scale database of images of people's faces, often without their knowledge and consent. And because the system can't function without this database, it's in violation of the right to privacy by design. Secondly, it's against the right to equality and non-discrimination. Beyond having been proven time and time again to have baked in racial biases, facial recognition in the context of Palestine is used predominantly to restrict the freedom of movement of Palestinians and to exacerbate the existing discrimination faced by them. And finally, it violates the right to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly among Palestinians. It creates a coercive environment around everyday activities and disincentivizes people from exercising basic rights, such as the right to protest. It's, it's a kind of a production of an economy of fear, to fear us more and to make sure we are afraid. So we know the second piece of this puzzle as well the biometric infrastructure. That works at detention facilities, for example, fingerprints, iris, facial scans, sometimes footprints are taken as well. It can also happen at checkpoints when people are summoned to come in and have their biometrics taken, often without telling them what for, often without their consent, often under situations of duress. And this is all propped up by a system of incarceration that forces people to go through this biometric infrastructure. So incarceration is a key tenant of 
Israeli apartheid. Palestinians can be detained without charge or trial. Administrative detention orders can be renewed indefinitely and you never see the evidence against you. Palestinians are tried in military courts, they're not tried in civilian courts and military courts have a 99.9% conviction rate. Even if you're released, there's nothing to guarantee that your biomarkers aren't kept in the system and used for surveillance later on. Israeli security forces started having competitions around who could take the most pictures of a Palestinian to run through the database and see if they could find a match. And it's been referred to as Facebook for Palestinians. So that's profoundly dehumanizing to be treated as if you're part of a video game. So we are forced to use this system. We are forced to give them consent to giving our picture to get an ID in order for them to have a big database and be able to track us more intrusively. They decide to ban it and go against the use of it against Israeli citizens. But when it comes to people under occupation in Jerusalem, uh, we are the, the lab rats of this uh, surveillance system. So we have two pieces of the puzzle. We have the physical infrastructure and the biometric infrastructure. And we thought that was it. Except we started hearing about stories um, from individuals on the ground, as well as uh, from watching and observing videos. And we were seeing people being pulled out of crowds and identified whilst at protests. Uh, we were seeing uh, people being stopped and identified at the checkpoint, having not yet presented an ID and having not biometrically conscripted yet. How do you explain a situation in which people are identified without having knowingly participated in that process of biometrically registration? We couldn't wrap our heads around it. And then we heard from a military commander via an Israeli civil society organization. They told us about a facial recognition system that completely blew up any idea that we may have had about how facial recognition operates. We then heard the same testimony from another independent soldier, and then another one. The system is called Red Wolf, and here's what we know about it. Imagine you're a Palestinian person from a small village in the occupied territory. You've not registered at a checkpoint or been detained. You've not given your consent to the state. Now let's say you go visit a sick family member in Hebron, so you pass through a checkpoint. A little yellow light flashes up on the guard screen, but you think nothing of it. But at that moment, that camera has taken a little picture of you and compared it to other images and databases. It hasn't recognized you, so it's taken a picture and fed you into a system without your consent. And this feeds into a giant system so that from now on, any checkpoint in the occupied Palestinian territories or in Israel know who you are. Scans against other biomarkers, other cameras, other databases, all at a massive scale without your consent. Now skip forward to the next time you pass by a checkpoint. You pass through the turnstile and a border guard you've never seen before on the other side says, hey Matt, how are you doing today? And you realize you're now in the system. And you hope to God that that little light behind the screen doesn't for some reason beyond your control turn red. That is Red Wolf. And so we have all this information and then you look at the thing and you realize just how big and all encompassing and pernicious and nefarious it is. It can feel overwhelming because it's it's hard to know how you unpick that when these kinds of things exist, when these kinds of technologies are aiding those sorts of regimes. There is a complete lack of any information about where any of these cameras are actually placed. There is no law that completely regulates CCTV surveillance. People don't necessarily know about the specific kind of tech or the specific methods that are being used against them, but it doesn't stop them from feeling the effects. It doesn't stop them from feeling that feeling of insecurity. What's really chilling about this development in particular in the OPT is that people are refraining from going to work, going to the checkpoint, accessing medical services. Everything that they have to do just to get by in life is contingent on a calculus around whether surveillance will be present and whether they on that particular day are at risk. Uh, this creates what we call the chilling effect. People feel worried and discouraged from uh, participating in, in any kind of street voluntary activities or any kind of protest. They are discouraged from expressing their opposition to the Israeli occupation in Jerusalem. 
they're discouraged from practicing their free speech freely uh, in any public space. In 1967, Israel issued Military Order 101, a law that punishes Palestinians for peaceful political expression. Anyone breaching the order faces imprisonment for up to 10 years and or a significant fine. Palestinians already feel like the sense of surveillance on them 24-7. They're always conscious and aware that there are eyes on them, um, and it even like hinders them or makes them conscious of their day-to-day -day activity. And it's severely oppressive the Palestinian population from every direction. Someone is photographing into their windows from street level and looking at them from above without uh, the ability to to see any of that footage, to have access to it, or set up your own counter system if need be. It's to tell us as Palestinians and to tell Palestinians, we are here, we're seeing you, we're watching you, we're controlling, we're mapping your movements, and we're policing you, and you're, you're watched all the time. We can stop you, we can arrest you, we can shoot you, we can kill you. So the question is, what do we do now? We have such a huge system with dire human rights consequences. How do you stop that? There are always gonna be people who will continue fighting for human rights and be fighting for justice and accountability. So I don't feel hopeless. I feel overwhelmed sometimes, but I don't, I don't ever feel Hopeless. People have been fighting surveillance and apartheid for a long time in many different ways. Trade unions, churches, um, human rights groups, uh, ordinary people resisting through music, through dance, newspapers. It mattered hugely. If it wasn't for that resistance, um, white minority rule in South Africa, under some form of accommodation, uh, may have uh, continued well into uh, the beginnings of the 21st century. That was the crucial difference. I think it's important to understand that Palestinians aren't just victims, like they, they have agency and they are always looking for ways to resist and to assert their rights. And that includes a broad range of things like spray painting, cameras to make sure that they aren't, you know, capturing images to things like international advocacy to reaching out to solidarity groups. Uh, in terms of Palestinian youth, they want to be defiant in the face of what are considered to be the, their oppressors. They are perfectly aware of what's happening. They are perfectly aware of where the camera is and they are not shying away. Um, they are actively present because they feel like this is a form of resistance and defiance to uh, let them know, you know you are watching, but you know you are there and we're watching you as well. And this counter surveillance using the technology to take pictures of someone who's arresting, who's abusing and so on is also there. If I will see a, a group of soldiers coming in the old city, I will right away text some shop owners, be careful, they're on their way. So Google Street View, as it covers the occupied Palestinian territories, imagery is outdated, uh, it's low resolution, and it doesn't allow us to figure out the information that we need in order to establish the extent of the system. And so we decided to, for all intents and purposes, create our own. What you find walking down the road very quickly, just by reviewing some of that footage, is how inescapable all of these devices are. We found approximately one to two cameras for every five meters walk. And it turns out most of these cameras are made by companies not from Israel or Palestine. And that unlocks how people outside Palestine can help. We have a responsibility to kind of break the chains of complicity. And I think that we can all do that by you know, holding our governments to account, holding companies to account when they're involved in these kinds of human rights abuses. As consumers, in particular, living in countries that export some of these technologies, that gives you a lot of power. It gives you the power to say no. Oftentimes we're told that tech like this is necessary because it's about security, but it's, it's not about security, it's about control and it's about separation and it's about creation of fear because this kind of surveillance does not make anyone safer. What does make people safer is having freedom 
being able to exercise their human rights and being treated equally in the country that they live in. Wide-scale surveillance in Palestine depends on the participation of companies abroad. They provide much of the hardware that facial recognition runs on. We need that to stop. We need to force states and companies to prohibit the exports of the raw materials, the hardware and the software that enables facial recognition by Israeli security forces. We need to end Red Wolf. We need to end facial recognition surveillance. We need to end the routine violations of the rights of Palestinians. And we need your help.